Thank you for tuning in to Dream City Omaha Online. We hope you like this message and that it has an impact on your life. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more. Hey, how many of you are ready for the word this morning? Good. I am too. I'm excited to hear what God wants to say today. Uh, we, uh, we've been reading through the Bible chronologically, and, and we are at, we're at this, this teeter-totter moment, because this week in our reading plan, from January until Friday this last week, we've been reading through the Old Testament together in chronological order. Started in Genesis, and we've seen God's plan of, of redemption We've seen God's, God's plan of, of setting apart a people and, and watching how as these people who have been, been set apart by God and for God continue in this, this journey of trusting God and then distrusting God and walking with God and then walking in rebellion and God coming to them and saying, I love you so much. Why are you living like this? And because you're living like this, here's what's going to happen. And it's, it's this, this action and reaction. We, we, we know that for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. And we've seen actions and reactions throughout the course of the Old Testament. And yet God has remained faithful. God has remained merciful to his people. In our reading plan, we've seen how that the prophets come and they tell them for 70 years, Jeremiah says, for 70 years, you're going to be in, in exile. You're going to be living in Babylonian captivity. We've read through, through Ezra and we've read through Esther. And this week we read through Nehemiah, how that these 70 years have come and gone and God has allowed a remnant of people to return to Judah and Jerusalem. And one group, the first group goes back and they rebuild the temple. And the next group goes back and they rebuild the altar under Ezra. And then a third group goes back and they rebuild the city walls under Nehemiah. We read the book of Nehemiah this week. And we're not going to get into Nehemiah today. If you're interested in Nehemiah, we did do a four-week series on Nehemiah last year called Rebuild. And Nehemiah is a great book. It's, it's full of so many practical lessons, lessons in leadership, lessons in, in hard work, lessons in how to deal with opposition. It's, it's 13 chapters would encourage you to, if you haven't been reading with us, to, to go and, and read through Nehemiah this week. And maybe you did, maybe would encourage you to go back and watch those messages. But we read through Nehemiah and then we also read the last book of the Old Testament. Anybody know what the last book of the Old Testament is? Malachi, good. Some of you were reading along with us this week. Malachi is, is chronologically, it's the last book in the Old Testament. Malachi uh, was a prophet. We don't know if that was, that was his name because the, the name Malachi literally means my messenger. So there are some that believe that Malachi was his name. There are some that believe that the, the prophet was unnamed and he was just referring to himself as God's messenger. We don't, we don't really know. But Malachi comes and he, he prophesies to the people who have gone and they've returned to Jerusalem. We see in Malachi God's final words to Israel before he comes and he ushers in and he, he announces the coming of the Messiah. The people who are living in Jerusalem during this time uh, are, are living rather apathetic lives. And it's... it's, it's you know, it shouldn't catch us off guard. It shouldn't, shouldn't take us by surprise because we've seen this attitude throughout the Old Testament. We saw it in the book of Judges. We saw it during the time of the kings. We saw it during the exile. And now we even see it after the exile. And if we're honest, this attitude of complacency and apathy is not, is not anything that ended in the Old Testament. God's people weren't just apathetic before Jesus came. Yet here we find ourselves 2,000 years later, and I think if we were honest, there's a lot of God's chosen and set-apart people who are living lives of complacency and apathy. And in Malachi, God comes through his messenger, and he, he brings charges as he has time and time before. He brings charges against the people and their responses, what? Huh? 
We thought we were doing so good. What do you, what do you mean? I think if, if, if they lived today, it would be one of those, I was today years old when I found out memes. Have you seen those videos? I was today years old when I found out blank. And there's these, these different things that we go through life and we think we know, right? I was today years old. I was, I was, I was thinking about this and, and remembering some of the, the different things that, that I've heard. I was today years old when I found out that the reason they called the first show a pilot is because it's the first time it's on air. Huh. Ah, wow. What? I had no idea. And that was, that was the people in Jerusalem as God came and he began to, to make these charges. What? I had, I had no idea. How many of you guys watched that 70s show? If you watched that 70s show, there's a, uh, a young man who's, who's a part of the show and they call him Fez. And if you look up on IMDb, it's spelled F-E-S, Fez. Did you know Fez isn't his name? I was today years old when I learned that Fez is short for foreign exchange student. <laughs> wow, I had no idea. I was today years old when I found out that when, when you're going to an audition and somebody tells you to break a leg, it's because that they hope to see you in a cast. I had no idea. <laughs> there was one that I saw. Someone said, I was today years old when I realized that your belly button is just your old mouth. <laughs> Never look at it the same again, will you? It's just, it's just your old mouth. I was today, <laughs> I was today years old when I realized that the symbol for division, you guys remember, go back, to, go back to math. What's the symbol for division? It's the line with the dot on top and the dot underneath. I was today years old when I realized that the symbol for division is simply a blank fraction with the dot at the top and the bottom as placeholders for the numbers that are the numerator and the denominator because four divided by two is the same as four over Two, had no idea. This is one that really blew my mind. This is one that, that really blew my mind. And I got a, I got a picture just to, to show you. Everybody has an oven at home, right? You guys, this drawer down here. What do you all do with this drawer down here? You store your, your cooking sheets and your baking sheets. Did you know that that's not the purpose of this drawer? The purpose of this drawer, I was today years old when I realized that the purpose of this drawer is to keep your food warm. True story. You cook something and it's not ready to, to be eaten yet and it's not dinner time yet, just pull that drawer out, put your food in there, close it. The heat from the oven is going to keep that food warm without overcooking it. It's not there for your, your cookie sheets. It's not there for your cupcake pan. And yet that's what we've all decided to use it for. I was today years old and there are these things that we think we know and we really have no idea. We think we've got it all together. We think we've got it figured out. We think we know what we're doing. And then one day somebody comes around and tells us that our belly button is just our old mouth. <laughs> and it causes us to question everything. My whole life has been a lie. What is going on? I thought I knew how to drive. I thought I knew how to drive a stick. I thought I knew how to drive a manual transmission until the opportunity came for me to go to Scotland and I had to rent a car. Some of you are like, I don't understand. Well, let me just, I'll show you the inside of a car in the United Kingdom. Now, what's different about this picture? The driver's side is on the wrong side of the car, and the stick, you have to shift left-handed. 
Luckily, the clutch and the gas pedal are still left and right. But I remember I, <laughs> we got there and we landed at the airport. And I remember we were going and my brother was like, are you sure you're going to be good? I'm like, dude, I, I'm fine. I've got this. How difficult could it possibly be? And we land and we get our luggage and we, we go to the rental car place and, and we, we, we check in and she gives us the keys and we go to the car and I put my bags in the back of the car and because of muscle memory and because I grew up in this country, I went and I unlocked the car and I got into the passenger side of the car. <laughs> I'm not even joking. And the guy that I was with, who was the passenger, he put his bags in the car and got into the driver's side. We get in, we look at each other. Well, we got out, we walked around the car, and then we had to get in the right side. And for the next six days, I drove around this country, peeing my pants. At every red light, because when you pull up to a red light, you've been trained to look a certain direction. And if there are no cars coming this way, then I know that I can go. And so I look and there's nobody coming. And so I start to go and out of nowhere. And it's like, what are you doing? Oh, that's the side of the road you're supposed to be driving on. And there were like three or four times where I would be driving and we'd be talking and just engaged in conversation, and I wouldn't be like intently focused on what I was doing at that moment, and whoever was riding shotgun, we all, we all knew, all four of us on this trip knew that whoever was riding shotgun, it was their responsibility to make sure that I stayed in the correct lane. Because there were a couple of times where we were going head on with the bus, and just because I was talking and not thinking like I was in the wrong lane, I'm like, what is going on? Oh, I have to move over. See, you you think you know how to do these things. You, you think you've got it all figured out until one day somebody comes along and, and is like, hey, the, the way you've been thinking about this, the way that you've been doing this, the way that you've been operating, the way that you've been functioning, but when you're, when you're unaware, you don't realize. You don't, you don't know what that drawer is for. Most of us, we do that because our moms did it. We do it because our grandparents did it. We do it because everybody that we know does it as well, right? How many things are you doing wrong in your spiritual life? Because it's what you saw your parents do. What incorrect mindsets do we have? Because it's the same mindset as everyone else in our lives. Because nobody has told us any different. You're not aware until you're aware. We think we know, but we really have no idea. And that's kind of where the, the people in Jerusalem, the people in Judah, the people in Israel found themselves when Malachi comes. Malachi comes and he, he begins to, to bring the word of the Lord and their responses. Huh? What? When? How? Why? No. God's like, yeah. And we're like, no. God, really? Yes, really. Malachi chapter one, verse one. We're gonna, we're gonna read through some of it together, and there's a couple principles that I wanna I wanna bring your attention to today. This is the message that the Lord gave to Israel through the prophet Malachi, verse two. I have always loved you. I've always loved you. Some of you were here a few weeks ago and remember when I sang Boys to Men. I really wanted to sing Whitney Houston today, but I'm not going to. <laughs> Some of you are like, thank you. God says, I have always loved you, but you retort, really? How have you loved us? And the Lord replies this, is how I showed my love for you. It goes all the way back to Jacob. Jacob and Esau and Jacob I, I loved and, and Esau I rejected and devastated his hill country. I turned his inheritance into a desert. God says, I've always loved you. And the response is, really? 
God, how have you loved us? God, what have you done for us? So many times in our relationship with the Lord, it's, it's easy for us to what have you done for me lately attitude. We come in and Angel talks about God being a good, good father. And it's like, oh, really? How is he a good father? How is he a good father when, when my marriage is falling apart? How is he a good father when I lost my job? How is he, when was he ever a good father to me? We take a, a step back and we examine the totality of context here. It would be very easy for us to, to recognize their faulty thinking and the reason behind their faulty thinking. They were in exile for 70 years. They've been back now for 100 years, and they, they heard the prophecies. You're going to go back. Kingdom's going to be established. I'm going to return you and replant you. I'm going to bless you. My favor is going to be upon you. And as they've gone back, it's just been one struggle after another and opposition after opposition. And in their minds, they were going to go back, and it was going to be like it was under the the reign of King David or King Solomon and God's blessings were going to be there. And yet there are still foreign powers that are oppressing us. And yeah, we might be living in our homeland again, but things aren't any easier. So God, how have you loved us? God, you're the one that sent us to live in Babylon and in Persia for 70 years. God, is that your idea of love? There's several things that, that I want you to, to understand, mistakes we make in our thinking. And, and the first thing I want to encourage you in is, is don't mistake God's discipline for his disdain. When God comes and he brings discipline, when God comes and he, he says, hey, listen, you're, you're going that way. And as a shepherd with his staff, as Melissa told us several weeks ago, would, would wrap that hook around his neck and bring him back into line. It's like, ouch. What's going on? God, do you not love me anymore? God must not love me anymore because the season that I'm going through, and God says, it's not that I don't love you, but it's because I love you that I'm allowing this. It's because I love you that I discipline you. Proverbs says the, that, that God disciplines the one he loves. My child, don't reject the Lord's discipline. Don't be upset when he corrects you for the Lord corrects those he loves. Those of you that are parents, you understand this. You have children, and children do stupid things. They say things. They're mean. They're selfish. It's all about them. And in those moments, what do you do? As a good parent, because you love your kids, you all know that sound, right? When the belt comes whipping out and so fast it hits every buckle on the way, and every loop, every belt loop. As soon as you hear that, my dad used to, he used to take the belt and he used to hold it in two hands and yeah, make that, make that death loop in the middle that was like a guillotine. And if you got your, like you were, lose a finger in that thing. He snap, snap. And you knew as soon as you heard that snap, my dad loves me. <laughs> Listen, if your father if your father disciplines the one he loves, I was his favorite. <laughs> Sorry Jacob, Sorry Jordan, we can put it to rest. I am dad's favorite. Because I was always the one being disciplined. Listen, in your life you will go through things. In your life, there will be seasons of pruning. In your life, there will be seasons of correction. In your life, there will be seasons of discipline. In your life, God will need to come at times and say, hey, listen, the way that you're living and the way that you're thinking and the way that you're functioning, it's all wrong. And so in order to get you from where you've taken yourself to where I want you to be, there is this, this journey that we must go on. And as we do, learn to submit to that process. 
And as you do, and as God sends these, it's not because God hates you. It's not because of disdain in his heart for you. But it's the exact opposite. It's because there is so much love in his heart for you that he refuses to allow you to stay where you are. He says, no, I discipline the ones that I love. Verse 7, let's continue in Malachi. God comes through Malachi and he says, you've shown contempt by offering defiled sacrifices on my altar. And you ask, what? How have we defiled the sacrifices? You defile them by saying that the altar of the Lord deserves no respect. He says, when you give blind animals as sacrifices, isn't that wrong? And isn't it wrong to offer animals that are crippled and diseased? Try giving gifts like that to your boss, to your governor is what he says. See how pleased he is. So you, you're, your heart's all wrong. You're giving the bare minimum. There's no honor there is no respect in your worship. It says, you've offered these sacrifices for, for so long. See, there's mistakes that we make in our mind. The second mistake we need to avoid is, is we need to not mistake God's tolerance for God's acceptance. God says, I've tolerated these, these sacrifices, but I don't accept them. You continue to offer them but it brings no honor to me because there is no honor in how you do it. What were they doing? They were essentially, they were essentially coming to a point where they were, they were offering the bare minimum. God, what's the bare minimum that I have to do and remain in your good graces? What's the bare minimum that I have to do to keep you from allowing another foreign power to come and take us into exile again? God, what's, what's the bare minimum? Minimum. I don't want to go past that, but just let me do just enough to get by. Angel said, we have three teenagers in the house, teenage boys, two of whom, their rooms are in the basement, which is where the Xbox is and the TV is and it's where I usually am most of the time. And so you can imagine the condition of this basement. Cups everywhere, cereal bowls everywhere, sunflower seeds everywhere. It's just, it. we'll go downstairs and it's like, hey, take that bowl up and put it in the sink. What are you doing? Take that, take that bowl. There's, there's cereal, there's milk in that bowl. Who knows how old that bowl is? Just take that, put it in the sink. And those of you that are parents, realize that when we say take that bowl and put it in the sink, we're not saying take just that bowl and put it in the sink. That bowl is like a euphemism for all of the dirty dishes that are in this basement. The reason why there are no cups at dinner time is because they're all under your bed. And so when we say take this bowl and put it up in the sink and our son takes that bowl and puts it in the sink, he thinks in his mind, ha ha, job well done, where's my gold star? And we come back downstairs 10 minutes later, and there's three cups that were right next to that bowl. And rather than grabbing the bowl and the cups, the cups remain. What are you doing? You didn't ask me to get the cups. Right, like how many of you guys have heard, you've been there. You didn't. Take out the trash. <laughs> Why didn't you put a new bag in the trash can? You didn't ask me to put a new bag in the trash can. It's part of the process. You don't, you don't take the trash out and not put a new bag in. What are you doing? And listen, I understand because I was there. And it's not that long ago that I was a teenager. Sir, we don't need you raising your hand on the front row. <laughs> I'm not asking for an amen, and I'm not asking for a witness, and I don't need you to take your belt off right now. I'm 38 years old, thank you very much. 
I was there. I remember. Like, you didn't ask me to do that. If you would have just said, and sometimes it's like, I shouldn't have to spell everything out. But here's the thing. God did spell everything out. Go back and read Leviticus. Everything was in there. They knew that the sacrifice was to be a spotless animal without blame, without defect. There's nothing to be wrong with it. We understand that. We read that. And now here they are hundreds of years later asking God, what's the minimum? God, how often, how often do I really have to come to church <laughs> to still be part of your family, part of a family, part of a community? God, how? God, how much do I, how much do I really have to give? Is it 10%? Is it till it hurts? Is it sacrificially? Because I see all three in scripture. So which is it? God, how about if I just tip you like I tip the waitress? And if they did really good, and if Pastor John preached really good, and if he made me laugh today, maybe I'll drop something in the box on my way out, just as a little, little 10%, because I'm not a 20% tipper, I'm a 10% tipper. Anything more than that is just, come on. Everyone's asking for tips now. You go and you check out at Taco Bell. It's like, would you like to? No, thank you. <laughs> but we can take that attitude with God. God, what's the bare minimum? There are things in our lives that God tolerates. And just because he hasn't come and smote you, <laughs> struck you down, you think, oh, I'm, God's good. God's fine with me living in this relationship and us cohabitating even though we're not married. And God's good. God hasn't said anything to me. He has in his word. Just because the angel hasn't appeared before you in the middle of the night doesn't mean God's not speaking to you. I come and I, I, don't, I don't give, but God, God's fine. God's tolerating, but God is not accepting. And in your life, don't mistake those things that he tolerates for his acceptance. Read his word. See what he says. Understand his heart, his character. He continues. <laughs> he says, here's, an, <laughs> here's another thing. While we're on it, here's another thing that you do. You cover the Lord's altar with tears, weeping, and groaning because he pays no attention to your offerings and doesn't accept them with pleasure. Go ahead to the next one. You cry out, why doesn't the Lord accept my worship? I'll tell you why. Because the Lord witnessed the vows you and your wife made when you were young. But you've been unfaithful to her. Though she remained your faithful partner, the wife of your marriage vow. So why, God, why aren't you, why, why, why aren't you listening? Why aren't you, why aren't you please? Why don't you accept my sacrifices? I says, I'll tell you why. Because the way that you're living is a life of unfaithfulness. And not only have you been unfaithful to me, but you've been unfaithful to your wife. You've been unfaithful to the promises that you've made. You've been unfaithful in the covenants that you've made. You've been unfaithful to the agreements. We had, we had a contract. I signed it. You signed it. You knew what you were getting into, but you said, no, thank you. And you turned and you walked away. He said, you've divorced your wives. And God hates divorce is what it says in Malachi. He says, God hates divorce. Not only that, but you're, you're divorcing your wives. And there was, there was no government assistance in that day. So these orphans and these widows were just on the street with nobody to care for them. And then who did they go and remarry? They went and they remarried these pagan women who were worshiping other gods. So you break one commandment with another broken commandment. God's tolerating, but God comes and he says, I don't accept that. I'm not good with that. The third thing that we mistake and we have to look out for is, is we can't mistake God's commands for suggestions. Sometimes we think that God is suggesting things to us in his word. Huh. It's not a suggestion. It's a command. There are suggestions. There are things that we know, like don't spit into the wind. Suggestion. You can do it if you want. 
probably not going to end well. Danger, high voltage, do not touch, not a suggestion. That's a command. God gives us these commands in his word. We take them as suggestions. Chapter three, verse eight says, should people cheat God? Yeah, you've cheated me, but you ask, what? God, what do you mean? When did we ever cheat you? And God says, you've cheated me in the tithes and offerings that are due me. He says, you are under a curse for your whole nation has been cheating. He says, that, that was never a suggestion. That was a command. There are commands that we find in God's word. There are commands that we find in the New Testament that if, if we're not careful, we can take them as suggestions and cute little sayings. And yeah, that's, that's wisdom for some that would like to follow that. But God says, no, that's not just cute little sayings. That's not just things that, that you, can, you can put on your Facebook profile, things that you can put on Instagram. Those aren't just cute little phrases. Those are things that you need to make sure that define your life and are marked by your life. It's not a suggestion. Pray for one another. Not a suggestion. Gather together as the body. Worship corporately. Don't neglect the gathering together of the assembly. Not a suggestion. That's a command. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Not a suggestion. That's a command. Have no other gods above me. Not a suggestion. That's a command. Don't be drunk with wine. Not a suggestion. That's a command. So many of these, these things that we read in the New Testament, it's like, oh, yeah, that's, that's good advice. I'll make sure and tell so-and-so that. Yeah. I know who really needs to hear that. I know who that applies to. Man, there's so many, in my, so, many, so many people in my life that they need to know what, what God is suggesting for them to do. Rather than looking into the mirror of God's word, evaluating our lives against the standard of it, and saying, man, I missed the mark so many times. I fail in so many different ways. And in my mind, there was just a suggestion in my mind, I thought it was like, you know, try it. And if it doesn't work for you, no big deal. You can keep having sex outside of marriage. I thought, you know what, I'll try it. But it just, it wasn't for me. And so the whole, you know, generosity, is that really a command? Do I really have to? And that's what they're saying to God. God says, you cheated me. What? When did we cheat you? When you didn't live by the commands that I, that I gave you. That was a command? Wait, we're actually under a curse because of that? Oh, my bad, God. I got it twisted. I thought you were saying, maybe try this. God says, no, that, that was most definitely a command. What are those commands in your life that you've treated as suggestions? What are those things that you thought were optional? that you looked at like the, the dessert menu at the end of a meal. Like, ah, maybe if I feel like it today, I will. You know what? Yeah, bring me that piece of cheesecake. You know what? Yeah, I think I'll try that this week. We'll see how that goes. Ah, didn't like it. Won't have that again. It's not optional. It's not a buffet. It's not go through God's word and take what you want and I'll take the healing and I'll take the blessing and I'll take the provision and I'll take the favor and I'll take the grace and I'll take the forgiveness but what do you mean pick up my cross and die to myself? What do you mean that unless I love you, God, more than I love my family and my friends and my job and these things that I'm pursuing, what, what do you mean I have to love you more than all of these other things? God, what? Excuse me? It's not a suggestion, it's a command. And then the fourth thing is this. Don't mistake God's silence for his absence. Don't mistake God's silence for his absence. And it's, it's very easy at times to, to go through seasons in your life where you're praying and you need wisdom and it just feels like God's not, like, 
And God, are you there? God, did you leave me? God, did you? Yet when we read scripture, we know that he never leaves us. He never forsakes us. We know that he's always there. It's easy for us in those quiet times to forget that. It's easy for us to, in the valley of the shadow of death, start fearing some evil and forget that the shepherd is there the entire time. It's very, it's very easy in those dark times where we can't see what's in front of us to, to see him there holding our hand through that process. But just because God is silent, don't think that he is absent. See, Malachi comes and he shares these things and he ushers in this period of, of 400 years of silence. Malachi is, is probably written somewhere around 430-ish BC. After Malachi, there is not another spoken word, written word, or otherwise that we, that we know of, that we see, that God gives to his people either directly or indirectly for a period of 400 years. God has led them and he's spoken to them and he's given them kings and he's given them prophets. And, and although they didn't, they didn't like the words that God was saying at times, and although they didn't submit to the words that God was saying at times, they always knew that God was there because he was always speaking. And now for 400 years, it's been radio silence. Did God completely abandon us? Did he completely, did he leave us alone? The end of Malachi, Malachi chapter four, this is how the book of, this, these are God's last words. The last thing that God says for 400 years is this. Look, I'm sending you the prophet Elijah before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. In chapter three, he, he told them that the the. The one they've been waiting for is coming and he's going to come quickly and he's going to show up one day in the temple. Then he tells them, I'm going to send a messenger to prepare the way. He ends it with this. I'm sending you Elijah before the great and dreadful day. His preaching will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. Otherwise, I will come and strike the land with a curse. Silence for 400 years. Now imagine, imagine you're them. And the last word out of God's mouth is curse. Remember when God said, how could I forget? It's the last thing he said. Remember when God said, like, prophet's coming. Hearts, fathers, children, children, fathers. Otherwise, he's going to send a curse. What do you think that means? What do you think that looks like? What, when do you think that's going to happen? For 400 years, there's this waiting. For 400 years, this is wondering. For 400 years, there's this silence. For 400 years, there's questions. For 400 years, there's conversation. For 400 years, there's confusion. For 400 years, they don't know what's going on. God, where are you? God, are you here? God, have you left us? God, have you chosen another people? God, God, what is going on? Yesterday in our reading, we finally get to the New Testament. We, we read Luke chapter 1 and John chapter 1 in our reading plans yesterday. And in the Old Testament, this, this moment, this time of silence is ushered in by God saying, here's what I'm going to do. And in the New Testament, Luke chapter 1 begins with Zechariah, and he's in the temple, and he's serving the Lord, and the angel comes, and he tells him, your prayers have been answered, you're going to have a son. John the Baptist, here's what he's going to do. He's going to prepare the way of the Lord. And, and go ahead, put, put Luke 1 up there. Verse 16, the angel is speaking to, to his father, and he says, he will, he will turn many Israelites to the Lord their God. He will be a man with the spirit and power of Elijah. What did Malachi chapter 4 say? I'm going to send you Elijah. And what's he going to do? He's going to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the children to the fathers. He will prepare the people for the coming of the Lord 
He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children. He will cause those who are rebellious to accept the wisdom of the godly. Malachi. God says, here's what I'm going to do. Silence for 400 years. Luke chapter one, the first thing that God says after this period of silence, remember what I promised you? You remember what I said 400 years ago? Now's the time I'm gonna do it. You remember what I promised? Do you remember what I said, even though it's been confusing and it's been quiet and you didn't know? You thought I was gone, but I've been here the whole time and I've been working behind the scenes. See, we need to understand and we need to recognize that the New Testament says when the fullness of time came, which means at just the right time in human history, God inserted himself into the story by sending his son Why did he wait? Because when you understand historically and contextually what happens between Malachi and Luke, it makes much more sense. Because in Malachi, the Persians were the ones who were ruling the world. But in 330 BC, a man named Alexander the Great comes and he conquers Persia, conquers Jerusalem, goes down and he conquers Egypt. He dies a couple of years later, but he brings about this time of the Greek empire. And what the Greeks and the Romans did is they came and they paved roads throughout the known world at the time. They brought the Greek language to where now there was a common language spoken by the majority of human population. So when, when, when God is like, man, I got to wait for the right time to make it, the, the gospel easily accessible to all the people all over the world, and I got I to gotta make sure that they can communicate in a way that each of them understands. Okay, the Romans, you've built the roads for me. Thank you. I appreciate that. And the Greeks, you've given them a language that they all can speak together. Thank you. I appreciate that. Now the fullness of time has come. Do you remember what I promised you? Now's the time. And it would be easy for us to think of God's silence as his absence when in reality, God was working everything behind the scenes to bring about this time, to bring about the fullness of time so that he could bring redemption, not just for the Jews, but for us as well. Today, I don't know where you're at and I don't, I don't know the questions you've been asking God and it feels like God is just being quiet. God, why are you so silent? Can I tell you, it's not because God's not there, but maybe, just maybe, he's arranging pieces behind the scenes. It's not that God forgot about the promise. God, you said you were going to send the prophet. God, you said you were going to send the messenger. God, you you, you said that the Messiah was going to come. It's not that God forgot what he promised you. And it's not that God forgot what he said to you. And it's not that he forgot the word that was spoken over you. But maybe, just maybe, God's been behind the scenes orchestrating and laying things in order to make sure that it was the right time. Don't mistake his silence for his absence. There's one, he is a good, good father. He's made promises that he, whether today, tomorrow, next year, or 20 years down the road, will fulfill. Because if he said he would do it, he's going to do it. But at the same time, we also have to take a step back. And while it's important for us to understand and know God's heart and God's character, it's also important for us to take a step back and evaluate our heart and our character against the word of God. God, have you given me commands that I've taken as suggestions? God, have you tolerated things in my life and my thinking and my family that that I mistook for your acceptance. 
God, what are you trying to draw my attention to today? What are those things that I thought I knew (laughs) only to have you today come and burst my bubble? I thought I was good. I thought we were good. What do you mean I've been cheating you? What do you... What do you mean I haven't given you honor? God, what do you mean you love me? Maybe you're here today and the reason you can't love and you can't connect with him as your father is because you haven't encountered his love for you. We can't can't give love until we first receive love. Maybe you're here today and you've never experienced the love of your heavenly father. And so when you read that, when you hear about God's love for you, your response is like the people in Malachi's day, really God, how have you loved me? God, what have you done for me? God says, let's just take a step back. The sin in your life, the wrongs that you've done, you know what the penalty for that is? It's death. Somebody has to die. But because I loved you, I sent my son to take upon himself the weight of your unrighteousness and in exchange give you his righteousness. And willingly he chose to go to the cross on your behalf. So when you ask God, how do you love me? John 3, 16 says that for God so loved you, he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. And that's the promise to us today. And if you're here today and you've never placed your faith in Jesus, you've never encountered that love, I wanna give you an opportunity to do so. So I would just ask if you would just stand to your feet If you're here in person, if you're watching online, you can just bow your head right where you're at. But this morning, if you want to encounter the love of the Father, I'm gonna gonna ask you to pray this prayer with me. Church, help us to pray today. Just say, Jesus, thank you so much. You gave up your life so that I can find new life in you. Today, I accept you not just as my savior, but as the Lord and the master of my life. Help me to live for you from this day forward for all the days of my life, being daily transformed into your image to be a light and a beacon of the love that I've found to those around me who need to experience it. In Jesus' name, let me pray for you today. Lord, I thank you. Thank you for those that prayed that prayer. God, I thank you for those that that today, by the power of your word, Holy Spirit, that you've brought conviction to our hearts. Those areas of our life where we've done just the, the bare minimum, trying just to get by, Lord, I pray that you would challenge us to take a step deeper, to go a little bit further, to advance on our spiritual journey. Lord, may we, may we not mistake the discipline that you've wrought for disdain, but recognize that the God you love for us is so incredible. May we not mistake the commands in your word as simple suggestions for our lives, but Lord, may it be the standard by which we live. That everything that we do and everything that we say, even as Jesus said, I do what I see the Father, I say what I, what I, what I hear the Father say, what he tells me to say, that, that's all I do. May it be said of us. And we only do what we see the Father do. And we only say what the Father tells us to say. May we live according to your commands. And God, we thank you that in those times of silence, it does not mean that you are absent. But by your grace and by your providence, you are working things behind the scenes for your glory and for our good. We love you today. Go with us this week. Give us opportunities to share the hope that we have found with those who need to experience it. In Jesus' name, and everybody said amen. Amen. God bless you this morning, church. Love you guys. Have a great week.
Dream City Omaha is here to help you discover Christ, recover your identity, and uncover your purpose. We encourage you to check out our past sermon series and our discipleship classes. And don't forget to subscribe to stay up to date.